Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Literacy View. We have a great show for you today, and we have a special guest with us, Lindsay Kemeny. I'm so excited. Yay, Lindsay. And Lindsay is um, an elementary school teacher, and she is currently teaching first grade. She also taught kindergarten and second grade. And after her son was diagnosed with dyslexia and depression, she began her deep dive into effective literacy instruction for all children. She um, co-hosts um, a podcast called the Literacy Talks Podcast. And she recently um, wrote a book that will be coming out this summer called Seven Mighty Moves, Science-Based classroom tested strategies to ensure K to three reading success. And Judy and I are delighted to have you here tonight. We are going to be discussing Nancy Bailey's article entitled The Science of Reading and the Rejection of Picture Books. And when Judy and I saw this, I think we both agreed together, this has to be our next episode. And this time I was actually first. Usually Faith finds all the juicy ones, <laughs> but this one, I sent it to Faith and bingo, in two seconds, she's like, done. Done, <laughs> that's it, we have to do this. And I do wanna preface this by saying that Nancy Bailey was invited to join us and she declined. Um, and that's something we could also talk about through the show. But for right now, I want to start off with a quote from the article. And it says, um, pretty close to the beginning, uh, it's hard to find science of reading enthusiasts emphasizing the importance of picture books. Picture books no longer appear to be a priority in early classes. So Lindsay, you are in a first grade room. You are an SOR, Science of Reading proponent. Could you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, when you guys asked me to be on this, uh, about this article, I had not read this article because I was like, this is too painful. I saw what she put on Twitter. I saw the, you know, her headline and I'm like, nope, that's, it's going to be filled with inaccuracies. It's going to make me mad. <laughs> and then you invited me and I'm like, oh, I have to read it. And I told you, Faith, this is going to be really painful for me. <laughs> <laughs> so my first thing I would say to Nancy, because she's saying it's hard to find science of reading enthusiasts emphasizing the importance of picture books. I would say have you ever been to a conference grounded in the science of reading? Have you ever watched webinars with people in the science of reading? Because um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at Plain Talk and I was in Maria Murray's um, session on language comprehension. And guess what? She's talking about text talks. What are text talks? This whole, you know, routine for reading picture books to your students. Um, same conference, Sonia Cabell is talking about um, using books to build students' knowledge. Um, look up dialogic reading. Many of That's science- That's in my reading. book. That's yes. in my book. If only I would have known. I talk about dialogic reading. Yeah. It's Yeah, it's all about picture books. I watched a webinar probably within the last three months. Um, Lakeisha Johnson has this great website called Maya's Book Nook. Have you guys heard of that? Yes. And it's all about diverse children's literature. And literally, I watched that webinar. It was put on through Patton, who's, which is, you know, a big science of reading organization, mm -hmm. right, in, in Pennsylvania. And it's all about bringing in diverse literature into your classroom. And after I watched that, I went to her website. I ended up writing a donors choose project for all these beautiful diverse books for my classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, if you've read Bringing Words to Life, any anything on vocabulary. That's right. They're going to be talking about literature. Um, I just, I just, you know, it doesn't. And then she said in the comments, I don't know if you saw in the comments on that blog. I did. Um, something she said, well, if you Google science of reading and picture books, nothing comes up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is this your source? You know, yeah. 
try looking up other things, complex text, read aloud, um, dialogic reading. Um, I think if you Google dialogic reading, the first article that comes up is from Reading Rockets, which is mm -hmm. a science reading. Yes, yes. So yeah, tons to say on that. Ton tons, tons to say. Judy, so you are also an early childhood um, trained teacher. And your coaching experience um, originally was mostly in the K to two classrooms. I was a first grade teacher, but I want to turn it over to you. Your thoughts, either on what Lindsay said or your own experiences. So basically, I think that, you know, the tide is shifting right now in literacy, right? There's a big, big movement towards, you know, structured literacy. What does that look like? a lot of talk about decodables and so forth. And, you know, structured literacy doesn't mean that you're not going to have picture books. They're still in a structured literacy block should be a read aloud. There should still be, you know what? Decodable texts sometimes have very interesting stories and some interesting things too. I think it's very important for kids to still have their bedtime story with their parents, shared reading experiences with their teachers. But, you know, I think it is a hard time because we are all thinking, what does the right library look like in a classroom right now? Does it mean we take level text and throw it out? Does it mean that we're going to have combinations of books? Listen, picture book books cause many problems if it's um, used by the kid, especially in that like drop everything and read period. You know what those picture books do? They end up being in the air, upside down, this way, that way. Kids in my professional opinion, priority number one is they have to learn how to lift the words off the page and learn how to read. And that means they need a lot of practice with books that are decodable. That's true. They also have foundations, right? Or phonics. And they need to learn, oh, I saw this here. Now let me apply this there in an actual book. However, nowhere in the world have I seen one SOR person or one person that believes in structured literacy say, no way, read alouds are done. Knowledge building isn't done. It's been the biggest discussion, right, Faith? Our last episode, that's all we all talked about. That's yeah. all part of seeing books with pictures, experiencing that oral language, having conversations with your parent, your teacher as you're reading. So who the hell said picture books are done? That's I don't. Yeah. I don't understand it myself. Um, I recently actually did a PD for a preschool, you, you know, UPK, um, universal preschool, where the whole thing was about choosing the read aloud, how to choose a strong read aloud and how to use it to hit on a different number of things. One being building language, another vocabulary, along with building phonological awareness and choosing them accordingly. So, I mean, and it was well-received by teachers. So I don't understand where this is coming from. And I think, Lindsay, you just said, you know, Googling something, that's your source. I looked through this article just to make sure a couple of times, and Everything is anecdotal. Everything here is anecdotal. And I don't understand where Nancy Bailey is getting her information from. Maybe, and that's something I would have wanted to ask her. Faith, maybe she got it on chat, chat GPT. I think there was a reference. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Yeah, How do you yeah. trust chat GPT? You asked a nonsense question. What does... Uh, Pick, or should picture books be in the classroom or some nonsense? And then you're relying on chat GPT to give you the answer instead of walking into the classrooms and actually seeing what's going on? Come yeah. on. And she's trying to stir up this fear in people against the science of reading. So yes. why are you doing that? You know, what are your motives? Do you have some skin in the game? Is it something you're trying to defend that you've, you know? Yeah, interesting. I was actually just going to say that what what's what's the point here and it does sound like there is um a way of stirring up fear in people that the science of reading um is political there are political reasons for the science of reading 
and that technology is going to replace teachers and other articles. I mean, there's a whole narrative that seems to feed this. And, you know, she wrote a book with Diane Ravage and um, there's a whole bunch of people that seem to back this. Um, both of you, your thoughts, jump in. I mean, I have plenty right now, but go she's, ahead. she's just, she's trying to paint the signs of reading in this negative light. And so you can just see that bias come through right away. Um, when she's saying, you know, regimented teaching, you know, she's trying to make it like this evil military, like approach, whatever, you know, and, and in the conversations in Twitter, even with people that are saying, no, we don't. Yes. We like picture books. We don't reject picture books. She, she didn't seem to accept any of those. Um, and it was just like people talking in circles, you know, it was just like, there was nothing you could say that was going to change her mind. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I see that um, with a lot of people on Twitter. Um, well, say Twitter's a very angry world sometimes. It is a little, <laughs> it's like a little bit crazy on there on Twitter. <laughs> it, it could be, it could be, but. And, it, and you know what, maybe, because it's so angry on Twitter, maybe that's why some people are scared to have those honest discussions. Like I would have loved to have heard what, what she had to say had she come on the show today. Yes. You know, that's yes. the only way we really shift the needle forward. We can't be afraid of these discussions, but unfortunately what does happen very often on social media is it gets ugly. There's a way of having civil discussions without it being ugly. And I think that's what we're bringing to the table today. And I would have loved to have talked to her, especially a lot of my former training was in balanced literacy. I'm not embarrassed to say it. So was a lot of people in this country. Mm -hmm. However, I've made many shifts. I do think there was a very interesting thing in the article. It says, do children have to learn phonics before they learn to read and write? No, children actually learn phonics while they are talking, reading and writing. Guess what? When I did reading recovery in 2013, and you all know that I've told you many times, many of the things that I learned there were truly best practices that were fully aligned with the science of reading. However, the phonics piece stunk. It was like this little informal thing. Get your mouth ready for the... <laughs> Come on, what the hell is that? We That piece was missing. Kids need explicit phonics instruction. Faith and I go back and forth a little bit about those syllable types. You know, I love them. And that's <laughs> a big part of my life right now. But teachers weren't trained. Many teachers, including myself, years back, we weren't trained in telling kids how to problem solve words. There's a vowel team. Let's make that sound. It doesn't just happen naturally, yes. When you're showing a leveled book, you might see a little thing and you might say, oh, there's this part. I that do, you I do think there are probably about a third of the kids where it could just fall into place like there that. Is, right? I mean, I could tell you with my own children, I did not um, do much more than talking, yeah. reading and giving them writing tools. But yeah. Lindsay... Your son was different from your other children. You were just telling us about that. Why right. don't you tell um, the audience a little bit about your own personal experience? Yeah, well, my first two sons were like that. They picked up reading so easily. And um, it's just, you know, they were in that third that you're talking about, Faith, where they just picked it up. But I didn't have to do much. They were always kind of top of the class, really great readers. Then my third son comes along and I'm thinking it's like preschool age. Why can't he learn his letters? This is so difficult. He can't learn the letters of the alphabet. And it was so much harder. And um, I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, I work with him more than any other, any of my other children. And he still struggles to read. And I couldn't figure out why. Um, and it wasn't until second grade that he, um, at the end of second grade, he was diagnosed with dyslexia and I was dyslexia. What is that? I had no idea. I'm like, he doesn't see backwards, which, you know, that is a very popular myth of dyslexia. And, um, and that's what started me on my journey. And sometimes it scares me to think about what, what if he didn't have a dyslexia, where would I be as a teacher? Like, would I, would I have learned about what we call now the science of reading? Right. I don't know. 
Mm -hmm. And it is like you said, some of those kids just learn it. And so that's why um, sometimes it's hard because teachers are saying, no, I have kids that I teach them to read every year. Balanced literacy works or whole language works, you know, um, and they don't realize they could be reaching way more children in the classroom if they used a different approach. You know, I think Nancy Bailey's um, position, and again, she's not here, so this is just, um, you know, what I think. I think she and others in that camp or, you know, proponents of what they feel kind of think, well, if a child does have dyslexia, like your son, Lindsay, well, then there's a reason. But most kids would be able to um, do just fine with, um, you know, reading aloud and picture books and the kids would just pick it up and the love of reading. And almost as if, why should we have to turn everything upside down for some kids? I think that's kind of the feeling I get from reading because I read other articles by Nancy Bailey besides this one. And I do get the feeling that that's um, how they feel. Um, Judy, your thoughts on that? Do you have any um, ideas with that? So I'm going to try to think about it. For, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Can I do it? Are you scared? No. <laughs> right. So remember when initially there was sold a story and everybody was like, phonics, 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 phonics. We got, we got to get this right. And all of a sudden there was this moment like, dun, dun, dun. Don't forget about comprehension. And for a little while, they were like, the world was like, oh my God. People were so mad. They were like, oh my God, Emily brought something to the forefront. And guess what? She really did. She exposed a really tremendous problem. And I thank her for that. I actually met her personally. A former reading recovery person said thank you to Emily because she did reveal a big problem. But initially, I remember uh tim shanahan wrote an article natalie wexler wrote an article and everybody was mad so maybe just maybe her intention they were bringing i don't want to interrupt i don't know if it was mad or they were just trying to say it wasn't a oh, everybody was story. fearful Thank that you. we were going to neglect other pillars of instruction right. right right so maybe nancy is worried that you know, kids won't have those joyful moments or kids won't have any read alouds if a principal doesn't know how to like structure their literacy block and maybe they'll only leave time for connected text and nothing like a read aloud where you're reading stories with imagination. Listen, principals sometimes don't know what the right approach is and what you see from one block to another can look very different. And, you know, I've seen schools where people are like, that's it, we're only going the decodable route. That's all we're going to see in our classroom. I've seen schools where there's still leveled libraries and a little bit of decodables, a sprinkle here or there. So maybe the intention is to get it right this time. I don't know. What do you think, guys? I do think that there's like this tendency for people to overcorrect. So I'm going to give that, you know, it's like the whole tipping the boat thing that Tim Shanahan talked about right. in his blog. And so I, like, I, I do see posts sometimes from teachers and now these are, these are usually teachers new to the science of reading. So this mm -hmm. kind of blog post isn't going to help because it's going to confuse them, I think, but they are saying, oh, we need decodables. We can't use level text. And then you get like a fourth grade teacher saying, um, what decodables do you like in the classroom? And I'm like, hang on, for fourth grade, most of your students do not need decodables, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a very small set of students that do. And so I do think sometimes there's confusion there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that, that um, things are taken to an extreme or out of context. But, you know, what's unfortunate here is that there are some things that Nancy brings up that's absolutely true, you know, but it's like we like you said, Lindsay, you didn't even want to look at the article because it would just make you angry. And what's funny is if you kind of look at some of the things she is right about how important picture books are, 
and read alouds and reading to young children before they go to school and developing language. Who could argue with that? But then there are these outlandish comments. So get your bullshit button. I know these generalizations. Maybe I'll find something where I could press that BS button. I will. But it's just, it's so crazy. Like, I absolutely agree with her about the importance of librarians. My own daughter's a librarian and about a school library and reading aloud to kids. So, and, and this is what I find with so many people who um, go to this extreme, like they're anti-SOR. And it's like, do you even know what that means? That's, I just don't yes. get it. Obviously not, because her very first sentence is, the science of reading rejects the importance of picture books to children learning to read. Okay, when we're talking about the science of reading, we're talking about a research base. There's no research that say we reject the importance of picture books. There's no, none. Right. So no. she doesn't understand what the science of reading is. It's, it's all provocative. It's all to kind of get a rise and get people either angry or fearful, one or the other. And, you know, I think that's what's happening here. And if that's not her intention, then she really needs to say things differently. Or like you said, Judy, get into a classroom and see what this actually looks like, because it sounds as though she's far removed. That's what it appears. But faith, to but faith, but faith. But faith. But yes, but yes, but yes. Go ahead. <laughs> I think Nancy might have a point that some schools, because this is a time of change and restructuring and big shifts, might not see the importance of a couple of things that we've been discussing, like those read alouds or shared reading. And what does that look like? You know, these things are important to think about, right? So I give her credit for at least bringing it to the conversation plate. Well, she no? didn't just bring it up. She said it like it's happening. And this is what I heard. I saw her on Twitter. This is what I'm hearing. And, you know, and from whom? Like, what, like what, what, what are we talking about here? I don't even understand. Say, say what, you know, what your source, source is. I don't even understand where this is coming from. It does not make sense to me. I don't know, Lindsay, you look like you want to have something to say and jump well, in. Well, she's, she's making it like the experts are saying this and, the, and that the science of reading, we don't do picture books and all this. Okay, maybe there's some people that are confused. Um, right. That doesn't that's mean that's what the experts and people who are advocates for science of reading are saying or believe, right. you know? Right. You know, I, I have to tell you, every time I'm coaching teachers, we talk about the importance of decodables as children are learning to get the practice opportunities in, but at the same time, always talking about the importance of reading aloud and building language and building vocabulary. That one does not mean you ignore the other. And I don't know anybody who feels that way. I really don't. I mean, there's no, no big issue. Like say you're a parent and you're reading a beautiful book to your child and the child wants to hold it and look at the picture with you and talk about that that's okay I think what's going on for many teachers now you know I've been doing this for a while the shift right but some people are just shifting mm -hmm. and I just think that people are looking for clarity you know yeah. and I do think the word picture itself has caused a lot of pain for a lot of parents and a lot of children, because what was happening, unfortunately, in classrooms, when we were doing things like guided reading and so forth, we paid so much attention to the pictures and made that the main source of conversation. And as a result, kids, unfortunately, were guessing words, even if the teacher didn't intend for a kid to guess words, and they were just utilizing the picture in a negative way. So I think pictures are very purposeful. They have great value, but we have to be very intentional with what we're doing and the why. Well, now, that's, that's exactly in right? the article. I just want to right. say, but in right. the article, she's confusing the two. Yes. It's completely confused. 
And she said, explain that, Faith. You say confused, but explain. Can you so, tell me more about that? So, what she's talking about here are um, she's talking about learning to read words and talking about picture books in the same conversation. And right. they're two separate purposes. It just doesn't even make sense. What SOR advocates are saying is don't use the pictures as a way to decode a word. You should be looking at the word and reading left to right all through the word and not using the picture. That doesn't mean you don't value picture books for what they're worth as, a, as far as building language and vocabulary. But through this whole article, that's the, you know, that's the implication. And it's so confusing, even says here, SOR enthusiasts suggest that children should not guess at words by looking at pictures, generally ruling out picture books. Yeah, how does that rule them out? <laughs> you know, that was the same quote I okay, pulled that out. that deserves yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yep. Lindsay, you want me to put it through the screen so you can push it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, touch it, touch it, go for it. Come on, come on. That does not make any sense at all. And then she says, the rule appears to be that until children learn sounds and connect them to words, pictures may hamper that process. So the problem is not, you know, she's misinterpreting the problem of three cueing, uh, you know, and guessing with the picture. So it's like the picture, look, all the decodables I use in my classroom, I love to use decodables with pictures. But the decodable texts are written so that you can't just guess from the picture. There's more words. The It's not a repetitive pattern. Um, if there is some of those very beginning ones, oh, okay, they can see that's a cat. If I needed to, I could cover the picture while they decoded yep, the words, yep. and then I could uncover it yes, and I could I too, look right. at the picture. You know, it's... it's just, yeah. Yeah. It, it's so off to me. But yet... I'm sure there are people reading this article and as we saw saying, oh yes, she has a point. And there are people who jump on this. So it's not like it's only a couple. There are a lot of people. There's a lot of people, but I think because we have this environment where people attack and when pe people, you know, like even with the comprehension conversation, People could not get past what's in their minds and even listen and talk to each other. So True. maybe I'm going to be honest. Can I be honest? And I'm going to probably take a hit. But yes, balanced literacy was a big part of my life a long time ago, right? Reading recovery. That community was very warm. How And many of us have shifted, but I do feel that a lot of people on the other side, and I'm one of the people on the other side in a lot of ways, right? I, I've shifted tremendously. But I feel the other side sometimes is so aggressive and come off so mean that how can we have these discussions and move the work forward? Why does everybody think I'm sitting here for a year? You know, I go to work full time. I tutor on the weekends, but I'm here for one really, really serious reason. I had training that, that the research says failed a lot of kids. I saw a lot of kids that I service that could have done a hell of a lot better. So why are we all going to stay so stuck in our ways and just align ourselves with this camp or that camp? Why can't we all just say, listen, there were some things that we did that were wonderful and there's some things that we have to do and shift. You know but, what? I think yeah. Judy, it's interesting, Lindsay. I think Judy makes an interesting point. And after reading some of Nancy's articles, and Diane Ravage seemed to say the same thing. They seem to think <clears throat> that people in that um, SOR world are arrogant. And I saw that word come up in a couple mm -hmm. of places in articles that really? uh, there's an arrogance, like it's the science and it's the only mm -hmm. way to teach. And that was what I saw. I have my own thoughts on that. But um, I'd like to hear from you as far as um, that kind of comment. Yeah. Well, I think I think so many of us are just so passionate about it. 
um, and we've seen the difference. Like I'm so protective of the term science of reading. I'm so protective of that term. And I hate when I see an article like this that's trying to paint it in a negative light. And because I've seen the difference it has made for students, the difference it has made for my son, who as an eight-year-old wanted to die, wanted to oh kill himself, sorry for the trigger, but oh he God. did things and he said things. And the science of reading healed his heart. It was, I did so many things for his depression. What helped him the most was the ability to read. And once he, as his reading improved, his self-esteem improved, improved. And yeah. that is just like so powerful to me that that's what I want to share with everyone. And so I don't want to come off as like arrogant. I don't want anyone else to come you're off. Not. Arrogant. You're very pleasant. But <laughs> yeah, you're a nice like, person. That's like, I think we all just feel this power with it. And we want to, we want to help students. Bottom line, we want more students reading and becoming literate members of our society, right? Because it just affects their life. Literacy is opportunity. Yes, well said. And sure. um, an impassioned plea, I think, for others to you know wake up a bit. Um, I, I do think though, however, that the term science of reading can be intimidating. And I've said this before. I yeah. mean, it is it is what it is. But I could tell you that there are teachers out there when they hear the science of reading, like I have to start learning this. Yeah. I have to really think about what I've done and throw it away and just start over. This is so overwhelming. I do think that happens. And to tell you the truth, I almost think that some of Nancy's writing, and again, I'm making assumptions, but the tone of her writing shows me that she's afraid too. That there are things that she doesn't know, that she has advanced degrees. Clearly she's a smart woman. She um, has a doctorate in education. She worked with children with learning disabilities. I don't think she herself could recognize that maybe she has a lot more to learn. Your thoughts, either one. That's my opinion. Well, I guess the only way we would have really have known is if we came here and talked about it. Yes, I would have loved to have her here to ask. Right, we can't we can't assume where she is on her journey, right? I I've talked well, about I'm assuming by her writing. That's what I'm going by. You know. Um, yeah. But, you I, know, I would yeah, love I, to invite her to my classroom to see, uh, you know, but, you know, like, hey, be reassured. We're not getting rid of picture books. And yes, I have a book nook in my classroom and, and we use it every day. Right. That's something she said in there was she thought yeah. they were just for show. And I'm thinking for show. I would not yeah. spend all this money and write grants and all these things for books just to sit in there like. You know, if you're genuinely concerned, then I would like to alleviate your fear on that. And, you know, and yes, maybe some people are a little confused and using decodables for too long and not understanding that we need to move students out of them. But advocates are not advocating for the rejection of picture books. I would love to see at least a picture of your classroom library and your classroom books. Yeah, I'm sure I've shared them on Twitter before. I'd have to go look. Yes, yeah, that would be I, fun I if remember, more of us. I remember you. Yeah. Shared. It would be fun if more of us did that. That's how we all learn together. That's how we all think together. You know, yeah. not just not just talking about it. Hey, this is what my library looks like. This is what my library looks like. This is what I use these books for. This is what I use these books for. Can I be honest, guys? I didn't throw out all of my level text. I actually have them at home. And a lot of the stories were incredible. I'm not going to lie. However, I really do feel in the lower levels, they were kind of toxic. Uh, there were words like lasagna, steamboat, tractor, knife. Now, kids haven't learned the, about the silent K. So what the hell are they doing? They're looking at a knife. And that was in one of Lucy's books or uh, from TC Running Records. That's ridiculous. However, you know, you know, I have the privilege that I work with a lot of kids one-on-one -on -one after work, right? So I'm able, like if like they've really been working on decodables and I want to a little make that shift, 
I'm able to sit there and give them feedback right away. But I do notice that a lot of the kids that are fragile, that definitely need that structured experience, revert very quickly to doing things like using the picture and guessing again, even if I didn't teach them to do that. That's right. Because they're still yeah. not 100% confident mm -hmm. in you know, all those skills. They've just learned about the vowel teams. It's not 100% yet. Now you're showing them a book. And I unfortunately have to say, I sometimes have to play this game where I take it out because I still do love my, a lot of my leveled stories, especially like in level F, G, H, I. But re kid, kids really haven't really broken the code until like, at least I or J. I don't even like to talk levels anymore because I shifted from levels. I uh, totally shifted to following the scope and sequence. Yeah, 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 yeah. My decodable library in my basement downstairs has some great recommendations from Faith and other people in the uh, industry. So I don't see a reason that other people can't just open their mind and realize it's not this side versus that side. We're all people fighting for the same cause for kids. And thinking about that intentional piece of the what and the why and the how is important. Nobody on earth is saying throw picture books out. Nobody is saying that a kid can't touch a book about the hungry, uh, the very hungry caterpillar and all of that stuff. I'm going to jump in because that's something from the article. You know, I forget exactly where, but she said something like that they can't even um, take a book from the shelf for enjoyment or something like that. I don't know, again, I don't know where that comes from. Lindsay, in your classroom, you have this library. Are you stopping kids from exploring books? I, I mean, is there a sign you teach first grade that says, don't touch these books. You're not <laughs> able to look at them. I Maybe mean, they're in Lindsay's closet. We don't know. Let's <laughs> no, they are out. Um, and I have never stopped them from looking at them. Um, even at the beginning of the year, if they want to get out, um, Pete the cat and they're going to like read through that and they're going to look at the pictures and they're going to laugh and they're going to remember when I read it to them or their parent read it to them. Hey, that's great. They are having a positive experience with the book. If they want to listen to an audio book during that time, guess what? They have the option to do that too. And they'll listen to a book being read with the pictures right there um, for them to look at and enjoy. Uh, I never take that away because that's a way we can build that enthusiasm for reading, right? Yes, yes. So, you know, let's wrap up and any last thoughts that we have about this topic that we didn't cover? Lindsay, I have one. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Jump okay, in. Okay, because this was in the, this really got me when, and this is in the article or the blog. Um, she says, parents concerned about how their student is learning to read should ask, and she has all these questions like, um, how much time and exposure does my child have involving story time and teachers reading aloud? Um, when do students visit the library to explore books? How often does my child engage with a book for enjoyment? She has all these questions along those yeah. lines that a parent, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like this is, this goes back to the whole language, like surround them with books mm -hmm. and they will learn to read. So yeah. no, if you're concerned about your child's reading, then you should be asking, how is reading being taught in the classroom? That's right. What specific skills is my child learning? Um, what is the plan to help them get caught up? Um, are you progress monitoring my child? What does that data look like? What can I do at home to support what you're doing in school? Those are the questions to be asking if your child is struggling, right? So that got me because I just thought anything the teacher answered with those questions she was sharing is, is not going to, it's not going to help them learn to read. No, no, it's uh, again, it's a narrative that seems to be built around um, getting people to think that this science of reading isn't real. I mean, Diane Ravitch herself said, there's no science of reading. I, I'm not kidding. If you look, there's no science of reading because there's no um, right way. There are many ways and that teachers, um, need to be educated in all these different ways. So there's no 
science of reading as if to say that um, the science doesn't cover all these elements of reading. It's again, it's creating this narrative that doesn't exist. And um, it's pretty frightening. And you brought up some good points, Lindsay, about these this bulleted list, because honestly, and I talk to parents all the time, um, parents, the point is they don't know. They don't know. That's why I had written my book, if only I would have known, because that's what they said to me after they read Failing Students or Failing Schools, because they were like, oh, this is, you know, good information if I only had this then. And now look what I know. But they would not have known this. And yet these types of articles set parents on the wrong track for sure. Judy, some last thoughts that you have. Sure. So first of all, Lindsay, I want to say thank you for joining us tonight. I know you're a mom, a teacher. You're, you, you probably have to write lesson plans, prepare your overnight oats for lunch tomorrow. And so <laughs> thank you for being here. Yes. Um, I really want to say that, you know, we can't just make assumptions about anything. We can't just say this, these people do this. We're, we're all people. We're all people on a journey. And our journey is to help kids. We can't say that kids don't love connected texts. Do you know how many kids are loving to see connected texts right now in their classrooms? All of a sudden- Are, are, you, talking about decoda, are you talking about decoder? Are you talking about decodable books? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Those are joyful experiences for kids too. Oh, I just learned this and now I'm seeing something that's connected and I could apply it into a real book. So this whole narrative that all decodables suck or that they're boring <laughs> is completely not true. Um, we have geodes that I've seen that are really gorgeous pictures in them, great stories in them. I've also seen some of the work by Elise Lovejoy. Some of my students are working with those books where there's the words on the first page and the uh, pictures are purposely on another page. And there's really fun stuff, even in the decodable, like these little things, like a dog is saying something and there's like this little cartoon coming out of his mouth, but it has a nice decodable word right there. That's joyful. Like it had the word, like, I don't even remember what word it was, but it was decodable. Bottom line is let's not put ourselves in one category. We're all trying to help kids, but that doesn't mean we should paint somebody as a good guy and a bad guy. Let's think about that literacy block and let's make sure that we do pay attention to all those pieces like read alouds, shared reading, um, structured literacy, small group instruction. Think about the pieces carefully and the purpose is very important too, the what and the why. Yeah, and I just wanna say again, um, I really would have liked to have had that conversation with Nancy Bailey, um, right. you know, I, I think that she obviously feels strongly about um, children reading, and she feels strongly in her views that um, picture books are important, but we all would agree with that. And I would really like to understand where she's getting this information from and where others who follow her get this information that somehow the science of reading is um, all about putting kids on computers. That's another thing I saw that it's all about the technology that will replace teaching and the love of reading and the joyful teaching moments. It's like I said, it's painting this narrative that I don't think exists and I haven't seen it at all. So my last thought really is that we're all, the three of us, all have experience with early childhood education. We've all taught in the classroom um, young children, and we could all say that the science of reading is about building language, is about building vocabulary, and there is certainly a place for picture books. So please, anyone listening to this, please understand that that is just absolutely false. It's just um, provoking fear in people. Um, but I thank you, Lindsay, for joining us tonight. It was great. And um, 
we look forward to seeing you again, honestly. And we look forward to your book coming out and best of luck with it. Yes, I can't wait Thank to read that you. book. Yes, that book is so getting much. a lot of attention. People are really excited. Oh, okay. So Faith, I want to also wrap up by saying follow Faith at Faith Borkowski on Twitter. Follow me at Boxner Judy. Also follow our Facebook group, Real Teachers Letting Loose. Give us a great rating on Apple Podcast and then Faith. Don't forget to tell everybody about party time. Oh, yes. And the party. Lindsay, if you want to come in from Utah, <laughs> we are having a big bash April 29th in Manhattan at Margaritaville, 4.30 p.m. And um, we're going to be celebrating our one-year anniversary together of doing the Literacy View and our birthdays. So if you could Ooh, come in awesome. and fly in. Faith, who's in my <laughs> I'll be there in one. spirit. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Faith, Faith, can you tell our, view, our viewers who's invited to our birthday party? Tell Everyone. Us. In one word. Everyone. 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 Nancy, you're invited. <laughs> we Educated. would love to have that chat with you. Anybody is, um, you know, anybody who wants to come, please join us. Parents, right. teachers, administrators, even Nancy Bailey, she could come. Let's talk. I just said that. I said, Nancy, you're invited. You did. You said the same thing. <laughs> well, you're too busy not listening to me. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All Listen, right. I, finally, I get to meet you in person on April 29th. I get to meet Faith. I've never met her in real life. I can't wait. And maybe I'll learn to listen. Right. Thank right. you. Thanks for having me. Good night.